everyone, and welcome to the first Ask the Experts webinar of 2024, Nurturing the Neurodivergent, Unique Considerations for Youth Screen Use. I am Chris Perry, Executive Director of Children and Screens Institute of Digital Media and Child Development. I am so excited that we're able to kick off the new year by turning our attention to the topic of neurodiversity by focusing on the specific needs of a youth population and their families that often go overlooked. We are thrilled by the response we've received to this webinar and we're honored to be able to bring this resource to you and to hear directly from an outstanding panel of expert researchers, technologists, and parents. Now, let's jump in and meet today's moderator, Dr. Merrill Alper. Dr. Elper is an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northeastern University, where she researches the social and cultural implications of children and families' tech use. She is the author of a number of books, including Digital Youth with Disabilities, the award-winning Giving Voice, Mobile Communication, Disability, and Inequality, and her latest book, Kids Across the Spectrums, Growing Up with Up Autistic in the Digital Age. We are so excited to have Meryl here to lead this conversation today with nearly 20 years of professional experience in the children's media industry as a researcher, strategist, and consultant with organizations such as Sesame Street, PBS Kids, Nickelodeon, and Disney. Welcome, Meryl. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, Chris. And I'm so excited to be in conversation with everyone today and to hear from everybody in the audience about their questions and concerns and ideas on this topic. You know, at Northeastern, um, in my work, I do have this particular focus on young people with disabilities and how, and their families, and how they navigate a technologized world that largely isn't built for their needs. Um, and my most recent book, as Chris mentioned, on this topic is Kids Across the Spectrums, Growing Up Autistic in the Digital Age. And it's actually available, it was published um, last fall by MIT Press, and it's actually freely available in an open access digital version online if you go to this link here, bit.ly bit.ly backslash kids across the spectrums. So as Chris mentioned, my professional background before becoming a professor has been in designing and developing inclusive and accessible learning experiences through media. And my entry into studying neurodivergent youth and their digital media use was in large part driven by a gap that I saw in how studies of and efforts towards addressing inequality in children's engagement with technology tended to leave disability out as a major factor. Though it's also critical to note that race, ethnicity, class, gender, all play a role in how disability is experienced across society, including for kids in education and in healthcare. So I'm really excited by how each of our panelists today does important research and community work in filling that knowledge gap. Before we dive into their thoughts though, I'd like to set the stage by providing a very brief overview of three relevant topic areas. The first is how we might think about the concept of neurodivergence as one that's helpful for understanding differences in children's technology use. The second is general trends in neurodivergent young people's tech use. And second is uh, general um, is considerations that we might think about when we're talking about any kind of advice or parenting approaches around media that is unique for this population. So first, so neurodiversity is a term that was coined by autistic sociologist Judy Singer in 1998 that essentially means that neurological differences are authentic forms of human diversity, not a deficit. The concept provides individuals with similar neurological differences with an identity to coalesce around, which is really important considering the bias, discrimination, and exclusion that they may face. At the same time, those differences can require very specific forms of support, be they social, emotional, or medical, for individuals to live their best lives. 
To be neurodivergent is to have a brain that functions in ways that significantly diverge from dominant societal standards. And to be neurotypical, which I myself do identify as, is to have one that conforms to those societal standards. This means then that who is neurodivergent or neurotypical is heavily shaped by contexts, interactions, and situations. Neurodiversity is not specific to autism, though sometimes people use them interchangeably, but it also encompasses other neurodevelopmental conditions, such as ADHD and dyslexia. Sometimes people may be neurodivergent in multiple ways, such as being on the autism spectrum and having ADHD, and families may include adults and children with the same or different neurocognitive conditions. How neurodivergent children and ado uh, adolescents and teens engage with technology is both like and unlike media use among neurotypical kids in several respects. So boys on the spectrum, autism spectrum and with ADHD report, for example, that video gaming is the media activity that they too engage in most frequently with friends and that this play largely strengthens their friendships. And like non-autistic girls, Girls on the spectrum similarly acknowledge that while online friends are easier to make, such friendships have risks and limitations, and in-person socializing can lead to more authentic connections. However, now there are significant differences. So for example, autistic adolescents reportedly use social media more for entertainment than friendship building. Neurodivergent children are also at increased risk for bullying and cyberbullying compared to neurotypical youth. This victimization and its emotional burdens further compounds their difficulties with mental health. Neurodivergent girls, for example, report high rates of social anxiety, which then spills over into the online world. In their everyday lives, neurodivergent kids may encounter a number of challenges that impact when, where, why, and in what manner they use media. So in terms of social communication and interaction, for autistic children, this can include back and forth conversation, understanding the emotional intention um, uh, and nonverbal communication of others and expressing themselves with language. Behaviorally, neurodivergent children may have difficulties with planning and executive functioning, handling changes to routines and transitions between activities and with sensory input sensitivities. Socially, they may experience social exclusion in their schools and neighborhoods. But life isn't always a struggle, and there are strengths and pleasures that neurodivergent children may uniquely experience too that also shapes their motivations for using media and technology. For example, some autistic kids learn to read at an early age, or what's known as hyperlexia. Cognitively, strengths of neurodivergent children can include visual pattern recognition, attention to detail, um, rote memory, and alternative problem solving. Some have a keen sense of humor when it comes to jokes that defy logic and expected setups. Others are very honest and tell it like it is, and also have a strong sense of justice and fairness. Now, I actually think that's a perfect lead-in to the introduction to our first speaker. Dr. Kristen Harrison is the Richard Cole Eminent Professor in the Hussman School of Journalism and Media at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She studies children and media in a family context, recently focused on children's use of media devices and content for sensory regulation, and how this use is connected with parent-child conflict around the child's media use. Dr. Harrison is also the autistic parent of autistic children and serves on the board of the Autism Alliance of Michigan. Welcome, Dr. Harrison. Thank you, Meryl, so much for that introduction. Um, my uh, comments at the beginning essentially repeat what you said, so I, I won't go into too much detail. Um, again, I am a professor and researcher in the Hussman School of Journalism and Media at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome in adulthood, and I'm the parent of teenagers with ASD diagnoses, one of whom will have lifetime support needs. Um, I'm also a member of the board of the Autism Alliance of Michigan, where I used to live and work before I moved to North Carolina in 2023. So I direct the FAM lab or Family and Media Lab um, here at the University of North Carolina. One of our recent projects concerned typically developing and neurodivergent kids use of media for sensory regulation and its connection with parental um, 
conflict with the child over the child's media use. So that's what I'm gonna focus on today. In my lab, my students and I define media sensory curation as uh, in this academic way, selective use and arrangement of media devices, content, settings, peripherals and environments to maintain sensory regulation through visual, auditory and tactile sensory inputs. In less technical terms, you can think of high sensory curation as the media equivalent of picky eating. Um, high sensory curators are very, very particular about their media arrangements. Now the ideas behind, or the idea behind sensory curation is that media can reduce the discomfort of dysregulating environments, those that are too intense or conversely boring. Remember that adults decide where children eat, sleep, learn, and play. The ability to use media devices as tools to manage sensory input should be especially appealing to people for whom the built environment was not normed, like kids whose neurodivergence involves sensory challenges. So let me give you a visual example of sensory curation. Here we have a photo of Katz's Delicatessen in New York. Those of a certain age are gonna know it as the, lo the location uh, of a certain famous scene in the movie When Harry Met Sally. Um, imagine being a sensitive kid in this environment. The clashing sounds, the visual clutter, the smells of different foods, the experience of being jostled in a crowded room. Now imagine that you can replace at least some of that unsettling sensory input with something more settling and predictable. Behold, the beautifully regular motion paths and soothing music of Minecraft, blocking out most of the noise and visual chaos. It's tempting to judge kids and their parents when the kids use media in public, but maybe this uh, portable sensory modification tool, the little screen device, is actually the thing that's enabling them to survive the meal with their family in an environment that was not comfortable or it's not comfortable for them. When we started studying this, my students and I didn't have any way to measure kids and adults' use of media to support sensory regulation. So we created measures uh, and we gave questionnaires to two, um, for two separate surveys of about a thousand people each. So it was a, over uh, 2000 people total, parents specifically, asking them about their children's media sensory curation preferences and habits and then their own. We suspected that sensory curation would be linked to family media conflict since what is regulating for one person may be dysregulating for another. Again, think of picky eating. Two people may be picky, but odds are very slim that they're picky in exactly the same way. So this occupational therapy meme sums it up nicely. Billy, listen, I'm tactile seeking and you're tactile defensive. Either we go see an occupational therapist or this relationship is over. So for our research, we measured the frequency of conflict over child media use for five devices, TV, computer, tablet, smartphone, and gaming console. Then we placed parent-child pairs into four groups according to how they scored on our sensory curation measures. Both low, the green bar, means that neither parent nor child is particular about their media arrangements. Both high, the pink bar, means they both are. And then the purple and blue bars represent the middle, parent high, child low, parent low, child high. So let's see what it looks like. The green line on the, the uh, line graph represents conflict happening about once a month. The pink line represents conflict happening once a week. So children who are high sensory curators are experiencing conflict up to four times as frequently as children who are low sensory curators. This is especially important for neurodivergent families because high sensory curation is significantly more common among neurodivergent kids than typically developing kids. So in our sample, the neurodivergent kids were mostly those with autism and ADHD diagnoses. And about 40% 40 of, 40 of those kids were high sensory curators. Now, we also asked parents to describe the media conflict they experienced with their kids. Most parents in both samples described mild or moderate conflict and felt they could manage it. However, some parents described conflict that involved a child who seemed out of control, especially when their screens were taken away. So here's an example. The most difficult thing is to limit the tablet time. It seems to be a life source for my child and when he's denied it, it becomes a serious battle. It ends up being a fight for the rest of the day and no one wins. Or this one. I will attempt to gently encourage him to move on to another activity which seems to anger him. Sometimes this will escalate to the point of throwing the phone, controller, device, or even breaking the television. His emotional outburst seems dramatically out of proportion to the situation from my perspective, but he claims it is out of his control when he has returned to a reasonable state. 
These narratives compel us to reconsider our time's up approach to screen limits. So I ask you as parents to imagine, what if you needed to lose weight for health reasons? How would you feel if your spouse, quote unquote, helped you by saying time's up and snatching your plate away while you were still eating? That's how these kids feel when a parent yanks them back into a dysregulating environment before they're ready. Now, both of those quotes came from parents whose kids were high sensory curators. Parents of low sensory curators had slightly different stories. For example, we do not have any conflict. I am the parent. My children have been raised to follow the rules and listen. There are too many children being allowed to do as they wish, including on TV, screen media, et cetera. The answer is simple. Do not allow them to use it if it is not what you want. Tell them no or take the item and shut it off. You are the parent. They are the child. Teach your child your rules. I have three teenagers, so believe me, I know how tempting it is to take the credit for an easygoing kid. So what are the takeaways here? First, neurodivergent kids use media for sensory regulation. They use media for all the other regular reasons too, informational gratification, emotional gratification, relational gratification. But adding sensory regulation to that mix makes it a very, very difficult uh, endeavor to reduce screen, screen time if the child doesn't have any other sensory supports. In addition, parents also use media for sensory regulation. We are not neutral here. It makes no sense to pathologize our children when we have our own sensory quirks. This is not a child issue, this is a relational issue. To reduce conflict, we need to talk with our kids as individuals, because each of them lives in a different body, about what kinds of places make them feel safe, comfortable, and settled, and work with them to construct or design alternatives at home or in nature so they have non-screen options when they feel dysregulated. This doesn't mean that they're always going to choose those options, but they need to have them available so screens are not the only way they can bring their bodies back to a state of regulated calm. And I will end with that today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate, and I think can speak for a lot of us in the audience, how you can't contextualize that it's not just about the child. We talk about children's media use, but children exist in families, and those families also use media um, and that kids don't really have many choices in their daily lives. And media is one of those things, especially with this proliferation of personal devices or easy to use remotes, um, that it is an easy to access choice. Um, and this maybe goes into then a, the, one of the questions that um, came from the audience about how do we teach kids to engage in that form of you know, while screens can be this very valid way of auto-regulating one's senses, how do you teach kids to, that maybe it's not, the screen isn't always the best way to be doing that? Um, how do you practice? How do you get kids to kind of work on some of those other habits that aren't those screen-based ways to regulate their senses? I think that we, um, the options are going to differ a lot depending on where you live, what kind of income you have, you know, I, I understand there are real differences in privilege, right? So if you have 10 acres, right, you can send your child out to just investigate nature and they're gonna find something that excites them or calms them, whatever, but not everybody has that option. I think what you wanna do is, you know, so often we take the approach of limiting, right? And now think of how that works when you wanna adjust your diet. Every, you know, adolescent I have spoken to about screen time, they all say, I, I, I would like to use screens less, but I don't know what else to do. And, you know, I would like to eat less junk food too. But if I only focus on don't eat this and I don't focus on, well, what can I go to instead? It, it just feels like deprivation. So I think when what families can do is take stock of the options in your home and out around your home. Um, activities that involve the body in some way that engages it. Um, provides a space of comfort. It could be an exciting, you know, um, an, an exciting pursuit like sports. It could be calming. Um, it could be a place somewhere in nature, like a hammock, if you have space outside, you know, to put a hammock or just even like a little seat in a, a, a quiet area, um, but something you do with the child. So, and you can ask the child, you know, how do you feel? How does this make you feel? When you find a place that is kind of special to them, then that stays with them as a place that they're going to choose to go. And it's so much easier, you know, when you can say, let's go do that thing you really like. 
than no more of this other thing that you really like without giving them some alternative. Great. Thank you so much, Chris. All really helpful, very practical advice. Um, we're now going to turn to our next panel participant. So Dr. LaShawn Hannon is Director of Teacher Preparation and Innovation and Assistant Professor in the Department of Urban Education at Rutgers University, as they're told, Newark, um, not Newark. Uh, even though I'm from New York and I've always said New York. Uh, her scholarly work focuses on the intersectionality of race, disability, and parent engagement as they relate to the development of school leaders and educators. Dr. Hannon is the president-elect of the New Jersey Association of Colleges for Teacher Education and the co-founder and executive director of Greater Expectations Teaching and Advocacy Center, which supports professionals and families with children with disabilities through education, counseling, and advocacy. So welcome, Dr. Hannon. Thank you for having me, Merle. That's a great introduction. So today I was asked to talk about, again, my name is LaShawn Hannon, and today I was asked to talk to you all about what parents, caregivers, and educators should know about Black autistic youth and uh, or neurodivergent youth experience with digital media. And so in order to do that, let's... Uh, Let's let's talk about it a little bit. So context matters. Um, who I am to this conversation is very, how you answer this question depends on which part of me you're asking, right? Are you asking me as an educator? Are you asking me as a parent of a 19 year old autistic young man? Are you asking me as an advocate um, or asking me as a researcher? And so um, I spent 15 years in high school English classrooms working with all types of students, neurodivergent, autistic, general education, special education, and um, I've seen a lot of students over my 15 years. And so um, I could probably rattle off what worked in my classroom, um, but I think it's more important it was more important for me when Merrill posed this question to me, for me to put on my researcher hat and ask my black autistic son. And so that's exactly what I did. I said, what do you want parents and caregivers and educators to know about how you experience digital media? And, you know, imagine me following a, a 19 year old around with a shopping cart in a mall with my phone up to his mouth as he's talking to me and like, Christmas shopping. So that's what that's that's what that experience looked like. Um, but he was able to very clearly communicate for me three things. One, he wanted me to know that he views and interprets content very uniquely. Um, and that to ask him to explain why it's different is like asking anybody else to explain why something they have is different is different than somebody else, even though that's not their experience. Um, he wanted me to communicate that not only does he experience that content uniquely, or he views that content uniquely, that contact, that content impacts him differently, right? So how he internalizes it, um, that's important. And that impact can, in fact, impact his mental health and other Black students' mental health. So the first thing he talked about in viewing and interpreting content uniquely, he reminded me that his brain doesn't tell him that he's black, his brain reminds him that he's autistic, right? The eyes that he sees, how he experiences and senses the world is through at first an autistic lens. And so that inherently comes with a different way of seeing, interpreting, believing, understanding, and so he wanted me to make sure that I communicated with you all that please appreciate the fact that your normals are different. Your normals are inherently different because he's autistic and because I, I identify as neurotypical. Secondly, he reminded me that his realities are that of a black man and that that is different than anyone else's experience that being a black man is not like being a white man, like, like being a black woman, not like being anything else but being a black man. And those set of realities 
are also part of how he sees and deals with content, what content is coming at him. And then on top of that, there are gendered expectations that he doesn't necessarily subscribe to because he makes his own rules, because he has his own imagination, because he he, he creates his own life um, that are just almost another um, way of restricting him and impacting how he views and interprets that content. So when he says that how he views that content can impact him differently, he was specifically talking about how what he consumes, whether that be, he's not a big gamer, how what he consumes either via television or via social media, that he does not see himself. And that representation is so important because in what we might call his hyper-focusing on watching movies over and over, watching TV shows over and over, um, being on social media over and over, is actually a form of him searching for a familiar narrative. It's him trying to find himself in what he sees, in what he's consuming, in what... Um, and what he's learning is acceptable and unacceptable, and what he's learning is right or wrong and right for whom. And so those considerations for that are, we have to be, as a teacher, as a parent, as an educator, we have to be considerate of what we're presenting and what's being consumed by, by Black autistic youth, especially if it's not in consideration of Black experiences. So why an autistic perspective may be have some more similarities once we layer on top race and how that gets experienced and how that is seen and portrayed on TV, on social media, on the news, um, in video games, right? All of those things are being internalized. And so that is how that impacts him differently. Those things are being internalized and it's being internalized because he's being given limited content because he still does not search. He still does not have a familiar narrative. And so this idea of you can't be what you can't see is even more important when we're talking about black autistic youth because we've rarely seen neurodivergent uh, people on television. We rarely see Black neurodivergent people on television, and we certainly don't see Black male neurodivergent people on television or consuming. So what is he consuming, and how is that conflicting with how he sees himself, right? So we have to be really thoughtful about that. Um, my, we have never really limited screen time for him. Um, what we did was we set rules and expectations. So this is the time for this. This is the time for this. We're going to stop now. And so he became accustomed to the routine of when we watch TV, when we engage, when we're on our tablet, and, and for what purposes. There's one thing, actually, I want to go back to here to talk about the importance of representation and, and just the layered identities of being Black autistic, Black and autistic. Um, you may or may not have seen a news report a couple of years ago of a, a, a Latino autistic man who had left his residential facility. There was a black worker who was in charge of him. There was a whole controversy with police and intervention and and the the black man was telling the, the police he's autistic, he's not harming anyone, he's okay. And eventually the police end up shooting the black, the black orderly. My son, who was a teenager at that time, was watching this and was trying to figure out where is the familiar narrative in this story? Who am I to how people are being portrayed? Am I the black man or am I the autistic youth? And so this idea of how that, that intersects is extremely important when we're talking about how he sees himself and how he makes sense of his possibilities, what he can become and what he can do. Um, so some recommendations and considerations that we have for caregivers, advocates, parents, and educators. 
the idea of creating versus imposing realities. My son is a dreamer. <laughs> he is an actor. He embraces television and musicals. And we have never once, I can't say never once, never say never, right? We have done our best to not stifle his creativity, to not stifle his imagination, recognizing that the world does not show Black autistic young men or Black autistic men in general and their narratives, we always encouraged him to create whatever that reality was for him. And so it became about opening up the possibilities versus limiting the possibilities of what someone could be, could become based on whatever um, whatever is being, whatever content is being shared. Um, and so with that, I just want to say embrace Black autistic joy, believe autistic truths, and colorblindness is harmful, <laughs> is harmful. Thank you. Thank you so much, LaShawn, for sharing truly your wisdom with us. And to also just sort of note the, um, the names of the of the um, the black um, sort of support aid was Charles Kinsey, um, and the unarmed, also autistic um, Latino man, boy, young young adult who um, was also sort of involved in that was Arnaldo Soto. Um, so it's really important to say their names and think about that the impact that they um, continue to have on you know, on, on everyday lives in this discourse, it's really important to acknowledge. Um, so I'm going to keep our question like a very brief, we'll have more time to discuss later on, but um, just kind of a thought about, I realize this isn't one of the questions, but I'm gonna ask this, is changes that you may have seen relative to how you've managed your child's, you know, your son's media use, now that he's 19, you know, because you've seen a lot of change over these years, is there, you know, one big change that you've seen I want to say like for the better in his sort of management or self-reflection of how he spends his time with media? I think that because he grew up with social media and all that, one, we monitored it and we really did not give him access till he was almost 15 years old. So there's that. Um, he just, that was something that was just a rule. And so now we make sure that we ask questions, right? What are you looking at? And not for the purposes of surveillance, but for the purposes of asking him, like, do you see yourself? Like, what are you learning, right? Um, what is what is interesting about that to you? So we're actually trying to get to know him better by what he is viewing. So because we've asked those questions over the years, and we've tried to help him, you know, make ask these questions of yourself. Why am I watching this? Why is this so interesting? What am I looking for? Helps him to then kind of self-regulate and say, this that's not the reason. Like that's not a good enough reason. And that helps with that self-regulation. That has helped us with helping him. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um gonna kind of keep the ball rolling here, moving on with our next speaker, um, who's also um, an educator as well. So Dr. Abigail Phillips is an assistant professor in the School of Information Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She earned her PhD in Information Studies from the School of Information at Florida State University in 2016. And before entering academia, Dr. Phillips served as a librarian in a small rural public library system in Southwest Georgia. So welcome, Dr. Phillips. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm always astonished people dig up information, but I think it's on my website. So of course, that's where I've come from. I'm going to talk about supporting neurodivergent youth and digital media, media engagement with a focus on um, cyberbullying, which is called a, mini, a number of different things, which I'll talk about. A little bit uh, later. My name's Dr. Abigail Lee Phillips. I'm still on Twitter, but also Blue Sky, where I, I talk a lot of my re research is about neurodivergence with teens, emerging adults, and also adults. So uh, I talk a lot about myself as a neurodivergent. I I have I was diagnosed with ADHD, but I have a number of other neurodivergent diagnosis diagnoses. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. I think, I, sorry, I just like to make clear as a researcher and as an instructor that that's part of who I am. 
Um, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Information Studies at University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. So hello from gloomy Milwaukee. Um, just a little uh, background in case just the traditional bullying versus cyberbullying. We may all be super familiar with this, but um, they often, they do intersect as well. But traditional bullying is what you imagine, like being kids being bullied out on the playground. There's a power imbalance between the bully and the victim. The, the behavior is repeated over time. Um, the intention is to cause harm. That can be perpetrated by an individual or a group, a face-to-face -face interaction, and largely confined to a school and school day, and, and at times in communities, smaller neighborhoods. But with cyberbullying, it's very similar, but it can remain anonymous. Um, a lot of the research has demonstrated, and a lot of the teens that I've talked to, they kind of have an idea of who's cyberbullying them. Um, vague, so it's kind of anonymous, pseudo anonymity. Um, the behavior is repeated over time. Um, intention is to cause harm as well, perpetrated by groups and individuals. Um, the, and the group group part is um, quite uh, extensive on, on social media, such as Instagram. And it can occur through electronic device or online, uh, anywhere, anytime. So that's, that's what makes it so destructive because you're, you're, you don't have a safety, um, like maybe going home or being away from it a little while, a little, for a little while with uh, some going somewhere else. And defining cyberbullying. Um, cyberbullying has a number of names. Um, online violence, online bullying, online harassment, electronic bullying. Cyberbullying is a more um, commonly used term, but within the research, it kind of goes all over the place, depending on what you use. And diff there's a number of defi different definitions, of course, because uh, in research, we love creating new definitions. Cyberbullying is any behavior. This is one I particularly like. I think it's just really inclusive of what cyberbullying is. Any behavior performed through electronic or digital media by individuals or groups that repeatedly communicates hostile or aggressive messages intended to inflict harm or discomfort on others, which kind of goes back to uh, the previous slide. And language is really important you know, when we're talking about cyberbullying because that's not and not really what teens call it. And I, I my research is between 12 and 18 year olds and also emerging adults, so 19 to 25-ish age. Uh, often they don't, sometimes they don't even know they're being <laughs> bullied. Um, when I started my dissertation writing about cyberbullying and bullying, uh, the more I read, the more I realized, hey, uh, from first grade until I um, graduated high school, I was bullied by this one particular girl. You know, just but it was like kind of uh, um, mind blowing, just because you just don't think because kids are calling it our teens drama. It's it's not a big deal. It's they're just teasing, or maybe they it's just a bad day, or it's just a combination of but gossip, bullying, and aggression. And it's a very gendered process that perpetuates gender norms. So um, there's a rela relational aggression, which is more common among girls. When this, I'm gonna talk about a little bit later, uh, that when compared to um, bullying among boys, what tends to be more physical, but is has been slowly changing as we've gone online. And they use these different different terms like drama or um, it's not, or just teasing um, as a way to save face, which I mean, you can, can understand as going back to your own teenage years or even younger, you, you don't wanna be a victim. Uh, it's just everyday behavior. It's not, it's not a big deal, trying to normalize it as much as possible. So adult language bullying or cyberbullying and the teen language of drama. Um, again, none of this is new. 
uh, just changed with online networks or um, Instagram and uh, TikTok, uh, Reddit, uh, online video games. Um, and again, I already skipped ahead to children and teens may not know they are being bullied until my awakening at age 27 during my research. But with, with neurodivergent children and youth or teens in this, in this case, they may in particular because of the way they communicate with themselves or communicate to themselves and with others may be an extra vulnerable to being cyber bullied or this isn't discussed much in, well, it's discussed in the research, but not in more popular media. They can also be the cyber bullies. It's very common cyber being a, a, a victim, bully victim, playing both of those things without really knowing you're being a bully because you have that um, disinhibition effect that goes on. So since you don't, you don't see the person in front of you, you don't have those, um, some of the clues and especially as a neurodivergent youth, you may not even, if you were face-to-face, -face, may not pick up clues that you're hurting somebody, that you're causing them to feel bad or feel uh, ashamed or feel a number of things. Let's see, yeah, almost done. Um, and I think a big takeaway for digital literacy, I come, since I come from back, library and background, digital literacy is really a big key into combating cyberbullying and digital citizenship. And I've heard from another number of librarians that in and, and school librarians and teachers that digital citizenship really should start immediately. We should start educating um, youth about um, ethical, responsible, and positive online behaviors and to be responsible users and creators of on online content. Um, yes, and I, I was gonna mention uh, Meryl's book because I thought I was like it's it's a it's a, I think it's a great book that um, talks about a little bit beyond and into the social and health inequalities and just from my perspective with the social model of disability how the the world isn't just isn't built for people. The neurodiverse it's not even thought of in academia um, my slot my references if you, i usually present in front of librarians or library professionals or las scholars i've been told it's unprofessional the outside of the library community but this is my cat um, while i was proofreading my slides this morning emmy lou just giving me encouragement great thank you so much abigail the um um, kind of immediate question is thinking about those, and I say this as somebody who like um, tried to write a great proposal around this to wrap my own head around it, is digital citizenship and like what specific, we can think about how all kids really would benefit from it, um, but what specific ways like say for educators or librarians, in what ways would you want to cater that or or specialize that in a way um, that would be extra specific or extra helpful for neurodivergent youth? Or is it all just that the same, you know, education, the same way of going it, about it would be beneficial? What I've heard from the librarians and particularly school librarians, they uh, see it uh, as kind of a digital citizenship, like very broadly, very much the basics and not really into diving into the difference between neurodivergent youth or children versus neurotypical. But obviously, as thankfully as we've, times have changed and the pandemic happened and more children and adult and young adults are be, becoming diagnosed. I, I hope, my hope is that there's going to be more focus on having more targeted digital sessions Citizenship, citizenship scholarship um, that really targets the niche areas of how to support neurodiverse youth. But I honestly, to a certain extent, I think just that broadly it would be really helpful just 
but um, there's there's still a gap in the literature researcher thing. There's a gap in the literature regarding, especially distance citizenship for neurodivergent students, but also neurodivergent youth and children as well. But sorry, that was a long way to question. It's like, I, there's still there's still work. Yeah, well, we'll I'll follow up with you so we can get to doing that work. Um, um, so I'm gonna, I guess, continue us on now with our, our last speaker, but definitely not the end of our discussion. So Dr. Anushka Zoyomi is an assistant professor in computing and software systems at the University of Washington Bothell. Her scholarship focuses on improving access of disabled and neurodivergent people to socio-technical spaces, which is sort of a fancy word for how we use technology to be with one another, um, and also how that technology shapes how we think about what it means to belong. So her work is informed by her previous career at Microsoft as an accessibility product man uh, strategist for Microsoft. Um, so please welcome Dr. Zoyomi. Thank you so much for that introduction and um, for inviting me today. So I am a assistant professor and I work on studying how people use technology and interact with technology in their daily lives. I focus a lot on neurodivergent users and people, and here's a collection of comfort objects that autistic young adults brought to my interviews to talk about how they incorporate media and hobbies in their daily lives. So this is, I, I like to talk with um, through interviews or my research, getting a peek into how people incorporate technology and so that I can then in turn design technology and offer guidelines for designing technology that are neurodiverse affirming. And today in this panel talk, I'm going to focus on how we can think about what are supportive and helpful technologies for neurodivergent individuals and thinking about this audience today of parents, families, educators, neurodivergent people themselves. Uh, what are some qualities of technology that are supportive and on the converse side, not supportive or potentially harmful? And then I'll end with talking about some examples of design characteristics um, in my research of specific technology that I've, I've researched and give you some examples of that. So as I was thinking about this question about what makes technology supportive and helpful to neurodivergent children and youth, I collected a, a list. I have two slides here about what I have found in my research and other researchers in the human computer interaction field of what has been helpful. And the things that are important are like someone's values, like if you if people value play as we should play and fun that that is something that's um and the technology helps the person engage in that then that is aligned with their values or if you value like i did a research study on teamwork and people valued predictability and accountability with their other team members. And so that was a value that they felt it was important during teamwork. And so then the technology should also support accountability and predictability. Um, identity is technology that is affirming of neurodivergent identities and allows people to express themselves in uh, ways that are uh, they don't have to mask who they are and they can see a, a true reflection of themselves through their use of technology. Embodied means that it's it's respectful of our sensory needs and <clears throat> we can have a fully like embodied experience and be kind of in our bodies as we're experiencing this technology. That's another quality that I think is important to look for, uh, especially when we're thinking about neurodivergence. Social emotional learning and awareness and connections with other people is important. And then also agency that people have uh, their their uh, voice is heard or their written word is heard, whatever modality that they use, so that they can um, speak uh, about their personal lived experiences and their needs are met. Um, and so that's those are some core qualities of technology. 
And then the last set that I have are about sort of broadening it out, not just to what somebody themselves is experiencing when they're using technology, but how are they using it in communication, collaboration, and community with other people? So a lot of the technology is right now, we're so connected, social media and online platforms for education. A lot of things are online. So all of these aspects about how do we make social uh, collaboration comfortable for people who are neurodivergent? Um, and then the last piece that I have here is celebratory technology. And I want to give credit to Lulu Ann Boyd, who is a professor at UC Irvine. She has uh, been coined, coined this term in terms of reducing technology, reducing stigma uh, through technology. And so what are ways that we can kind of flip the script and through technology um, celebrate the strengths and skills of autistic people and use that to reduce social stigma? So given that kind of set of qualities, I want to talk about three examples of how I would apply that type of um, framework to thinking about specific technology. So the first one is Minecraft, probably very familiar to those of us on the call here. And in, I did some research with a therapy clinic, the aut a neurodivergent, uh, they provide services for people who are neurodivergent, and they use Minecraft in their clinical approach. They host a Minecraft server for people who, youth and young adults who are in their services. And through a focus group, we found that there, it wasn't just the kids sitting down and playing, right? You're they're talking with their parent or other siblings or friends as they're playing. In real life, they're dressing up and making costumes and engaging in play. Um, and one of a parent said, my kids have a lot of Minecraft figures and swords and costumes. My older child is not a kid who does a lot of imaginative play, but will actually play real life imaginary Minecraft with his younger sibler, sibling, which is very sweet. So you can see that it's not an isolated activity and by engaging with other people, his imagination is expanding. And as they were hosting this, these servers, so they were moderating the services so that as they were encouraging communication and sharing each other's builds with each other and being uh, the moderator, uh, you can see his avatar on the lower left hand side. He was a clinic, a clinician, and he was able to then um, help with conflicts that might come up mm -hmm. as people were um, in their Minecraft server together. And so then thinking about this framework of the qualities I talked about earlier, like here's my list on the left side of those qualities. And on the right, you have Minecraft, you have Autcraft, which is a, a Minecraft server that's for autistic neurodivergent people. And then you have Minecraft play in real life, right? And then I filled out this table. I won't go into every cell here, but it gives you an idea of how we can start to assess the experience of playing Minecraft in those different settings and what sorts of values, you know, how does it fare in terms of those different attributes? Um, so like, I'll just bring up one example, like embodiment. Uh, you do have this physicality in the virtual world, even though it's virtual, there's still the sense of you are the avatar, you're building things. Um, it's connected to farm animals and all sorts of real life objects that are in the real world. So it helps make those connections. Um, and so I think that's a nice kind of view of how helpful this type of technology can be for neurodivergent people. So what a, another example is looking at Twitter. I did some research looking at Twitter and how people use different hashtags to have conversations around Twitter uh, and autism. And it was actually a very affirming place for people who are neurodivergent to share personal anecdotes, make sense about being autistic um, and advocating for each other. And so again, using the framework, then you could start to call out different aspects of Twitter that can be self-affirming, but also could potentially be misunderstood. Like communication is notoriously difficult over social media. I will just go kind of to the end of like, overall, I really believe that we need to scaffold the social group as a whole so that it's not just the neurodivergent person who needs to change or needs to use special technology, that these technologies should be personal enough um, that people can adjust the, how technology works to work best for them 
and that we really value the role of neurodivergent individuals as empowered learners and distributors of knowledge for other people. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anushka. Um, I feel like as somebody who you've probably spent a lot of time, you know, not just kind of designing apps, but also then like, or technologies, but also critically looking at, at ones that exist. Um, are there any, I would say both, I guess you can, you can choose different directions to go with this particular apps or websites, or even like features of technologies that you think that already exist that are actually like really helpful in potentially not so obvious ways as like an assistive technology, but, you know, technologies that it turns out they were actually designed in ways that might be actually really helpful for neurodivergent kids. Like I'm thinking of, um, there's a, in my research, there was a, an app Amino, which is like a fandoms, like kind of art community. And um, there's, you know, a couple of kids who, it could be really great, but also stressful because you're managing potentially like other fandoms and, but yeah, any just sort of features or apps, you know, for parents to kind of take away with and say like, oh, maybe I'll try that with my kid or, oh, maybe I'll like make sure I turn that setting on um, or check that setting out. Yeah, that's a great question. And sites like, I think community engage, like community platforms where people can connect with each other, discord servers, there's discord servers that are run by autistic people and are really like community builders. And I think it's a multimedia experience where you have avatars, you can have visuals, you can have a voice call, you can have a call with your camera on or off um, and you can customize it and have personality in your communication. What I found in my research is that folks um, on the spectrum really enjoy expressing themselves and being unique. And so places, I think communities online where you can share that is really important. And then also not always having to have like your video on so that you don't feel like you have to perform social interactions in a particular way all of the time. Yeah, especially when you think about that, how when it came to Zoom school, um, you know, the ways in which just the the neat, the having the screen on as being present, which is a different kind of potential like cognitive load for neurodivergent people than just physically just being there in person, not having to also deal with managing your own presence on a screen and whatnot. Um, so yes, yeah, so I guess we'll just sort of bring us all back for um, some questions that I've got sort of left over or kind of that came up as part of all of this, this conversation. Um, and I think the first question, we kind of direct it somewhat directly to LaShawn, but everybody here is an educator too. So I think that's something to think about, but thinking about the school environment, how, you know, it's not just, we talk, we've talked a lot, I think about like home and recreational uses of media and technology, and not as much maybe about like educational uses, thinking about all the ways that kids these days increasingly have to manage their technolo technology use for school at home or devices in school. Um, be it phones or, you know, laptops, and any kind of particular considerations for either educators, for the students in, in their classroom, or for parents supporting their child, for those sort of school-based uses or the school context for that technology use that might be particularly specific for the neurodivergent population. Sure. I think that one of the first things that we can do as classroom teachers is to make sure we ask questions and not make assumptions about students' preferences. Um, you might assume that a student would prefer to type something out, right? Or prefer to use a sort of any piece of technology because in your neurotypical mind, you might think that would make things easier, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And so I would say, ask, right? And that, you know, my son, love him to death, still has the handwriting of a third grader. It's never going to get better. It's okay. It doesn't have to get better. It's perfect, right? And he would still choose to use a pencil or a pen to write his essay than to sit and do it on a typewriter or, or not typewriter, but on, on a computer. And so that's that's his, even though it's written in his IEP that he's allowed to use a computer, he doesn't want to. And that should be okay because his handwriting 
and you having to <laughs> fiddle through it is more about you than it is about him. Right. And so making sure that whatever technology we're introducing, we we have the child sign on to use. Otherwise, it's just another oppressive tool. Right. And, um, you know, be flexible to whatever demonstration of learning looks like. Right. So it's just it's just another form of accommodation. It's another form of differentiation that just because it's available doesn't mean it has to be used. And what other ways can this information and content be absorbed other that is more preferential to the student? Anybody else want to weigh in? Oh, I'll just had something to add in just because I recently did a, um, a presentation on inclusive learn inclusive instruction for neurodivergent students. And again, this was targeting more undergrad uh, students, but I think a lot of a lot of it applies. I actually reached out to my students and asked them what, they didn't have to reveal they were neurodivergent or anything, but what they would like to see in the classroom, particularly like online courses and even in person. A lot of it was like closed captioning was super important to them, having teachers that provided that, uh, having, information in advance, like um, syllabi or some some of the uh, assignments in advanced and uh, just having a very simple checklist. Like I, this assignment I just do this day. It was blew my mind. And I, even as a neurodivergent who go, lives by a checklist, I was like, why did I not think about this a long ago? But it was such a hit. I had so many students possibly respond. Just a very simple, I've done this and carry on. Yeah, checklist is the best. You can you can make it low tech, you can make it high tech. Um, I was just word. It was perfect. Useful tool. Yeah, Chris. Um, I, this question just made me think of a friend I have who's a pediatrician who told me that her son, who has dyslexia, really learns the best with audiobooks. And she struggled because her entire medical education, you know, as a pediatrician, revolved around, you know, counseling parents to teach their kids to read, to decode letters on a page. And finally, she just said, this is ridiculous. You know, he likes learning with audiobooks. I'm just going to roll with it. And I think that's the key, right? When you can, when you can find out what makes sense to another person who has a different neurological system than you. Um, and then go with that because what matters is the learning, not that they are learning on your terms only. Sorry, may I just add one more comment? Just as a librarian, uh, there, there's always this debate amongst adults when children and youth want to use audiobooks. I'm like, that's not really reading. It, it is it is reading. It It's definitely reading and uh, it should be acknowledged as that. And it's just a librarian thing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Another question to, to think about when it comes to, I guess, relationships around media and in particular, um, you know, parenting in, in general, and parents are parenting more than one child. Every child has their unique differences. But when you're parenting, maybe a child, one child is neurodivergent and one child isn't, um, the ways in which those rules or those expectations and those comparisons um, and depending on age order, might get really complicated. So, so kind of advice or tips for parents who, in those contexts, when you know you might have the kind of family where you would like to have the same rules for everyone, but it's it's just not possible. Um, how do you how do you kind of contend with that? Um, uh, kind of in this day and age. Yeah, I'll take that one because that's my situation. <laughs> um, we have done our best to not just lay down blanket rules, right? We always, rules are rules for a reason. And, but the reason why we make rules in our house um, is really, is more about setting expectation than it is about doing what I tell you to do. Like our house is, over the years, and mind you, my children are now 19 and 21, right? It was extremely flexible. And, you know, culturally as a black woman, that's not what we, how we grew up, right? It was do what I tell you to do. So, so even that negotiation of that and allowing that flexibility, if it's 
the only non-negotiables in my house were issues of safety. Everything else was, was negotiable. And I know that's a hard place to be in, but it also means relinquishing some control and trusting that my children can verbalize or not verbalize what they need and what's best for them. And so that became part of our routine of talking through. So, you know, if we do everything the same guys, and that means even though Avery likes broccoli, he's getting 12 and now you're getting 12 too, because everybody wants everything the same, right? It's like showing how that just doesn't work. <laughs> um, and so that just became part of our, our family lexicon of negotiating those rules for the individual because you're going to get some things that he doesn't need and he's going to get some things that you don't want. And, and that's how we've, that's how we still negotiate it. Any other thoughts? Anishka. One thing that I think can be helpful is um, gameplay in not so much about how parents are setting, like it's not a direct answer to your question, but I think helping the kids to have open communication and expressing themselves and what they're feeling about these rules and um, and through gameplay, there's, there's serious games, there's a genre of games called serious games um, where you're learning about things. And so there's games for learning about uh, conflicts or how to negotiate um, things um, or how to relate to other people, how to have conversations. Um, and there's also a genre of games called cooperative games. Like we used to have a game that was like going to granny's house and you had this board game and you had to like together pick up, you know, the bread and the flowers and all the things you need to take to granny. And so I felt that that was nice way to open up uh, conversations about cooperating with each other and that not everything has to be a competition or exactly equal or like who has the most points, but it could be working together. And so that could just open up new kinds of conversations for a family. Yeah. Um, turn the, I guess, the, the question now beyond sort of, I guess, like both like promoting these positive outcomes, but also preventing some negative ones as well. So, um, you know, we can talk about how safety and like protection isn't just the individual responsibility of parents. That it's it's absolutely something that platforms need to do better. It's absolutely something that policy needs to you know do better, and that like peers need to do for one another in these contexts. But there's a lot of potential for really bad actors to do really terrible things. And so, how do you support your child, like the emotional impact of things that they will encounter or people they will encounter um, that do not have their best interest in mind or actually really have harm you know, in mind. Um, what are the best ways to, to manage that, that fallout? Uh, this makes me think about my, so my two children with ADHD diagnosis are 14 year old twins, a girl and a boy. And when my son, um, I'd say was maybe about 11. He likes playing Roblox. And, and when he was about 11, um, he started playing it and playing with strangers, right? From another place who are playing the game at the same time. And he told me afterward, you know, some of these, I feel really bad about myself. Some of these people are, were saying really mean things to me. And we just had, uh, it was, it made me feel really sad, but then we had a great conversation about the public nature of the internet about a certain percentage of people are going to do these things because it gives them a little surge of power. Um, how do you feel when somebody says something and you get that gut feeling that this isn't right or this isn't a good thing? That's a potent sign to you that this is somebody who is you know, managing maybe their own stress and trauma by projecting it onto somebody, a stranger on the internet. Um, what do you do about it? Oh, look, you can block them you know, and it's not because you did anything wrong. It's it, when we teach them, you're going to need to expect a certain number of problematic interactions. Um, and here is how you can protect yourself in the future. Then you, you don't have to deal with that issue of, oh, what's wrong with them? What did they, they do wrong? You know, there are predatory people out there and we have to have all of those conversations with them. But most of the research on, uh, you know, online activity shows that the opportunities outweigh the risks. So we just, you know, we have to teach them how to kind of pay attention to that gut feeling that they're getting in response to something, you know, trolling or 
or you know anything that's abusive online and then obey that gut feeling that that's their best guide when they're interacting with strangers. Yeah, research has shown that sort of blocking, like how to block is something that um, uh, autistic kids, like that's a thing that they have a lot of trouble with. It's not necessarily knowing, hey, this is a bad, like, you know, this is a risk, but how to prevent that from happening again is something that can be very hard to identify. Um, and platforms don't make it easy. Um, um, Abigail, were you going to add something sort of to that? Yeah. Uh, just a little bit. Uh kind of a positive and negative. Uh, when I, I'm thinking with middle schoolers and high schoolers, I would ask them, and again, these weren't explicitly neurodiverse, but they didn't share their favorite neurodiverse or neurotypical, but the majority of them did not tell their parents anything. Um, I think a lot of it depends on the relationship between the parent and the child, the teenager. Um, I did, I did have a few that would bring it up. Mainly they would talk to their friends about it, but um, as long as I think that having, not being a parent, I can not say this with enough, a lot of confidence, but I have, having an open and good relationship with your child is key, but that's key to a lot of things in parenting. But I was just a little taken aback that instead of, they're like, no, I would never tell my parent that I Tell my friend. Not not really helpful, but yeah. Um, I guess a question. I guess I sometimes like to turn this on is like questions you have for one another about your respective work. I'm interested, and I saw one of the uh, questions about this, about kind of the definition of neurodiversity, and we're talking a lot about autistic kids, and do you also include ADHD and people with learning disabilities in your definition of neurodiversity, and uh, do you, have you found differences um, across those different groups of people? And if I can kind of add just onto that, um, there's also a, like a lot of questions around like executive functioning and regulation. And um, I'm gonna like put air quotes around the term addiction, but around um, the centrality of a screen to a neurodivergent person's potential, like their mind and their and their body. And um, the sort of ways in which that might come together, that might meet multiple ways of being neurodivergent um, around sort of planning and, and sort of that kind of work. So yeah, if anybody has insights to share around that sort of, um, executive functioning, self-regulation, um, kind of problem, again, air quotes around problematic use, cause it's very contextual, but, um, for, for those kids for whom that you might need to use these technologies, but hard to determine when it is that you don't need to be with them. I don't, I don't know if this speaks directly to your question and you can stop me if it doesn't, but I think knowing why you're using a tool and knowing you're in like what you are hoping to get from that tool, I think is like the first hurdle, right? Like we never, we did not use tablets as a, or any kind of thing to, as a way to keep my child occupied, right? Like my child did not have, and I'm gonna put air quotes around this, toys, right? Everything was in some way, shape, or form, used therapeutically, right? Every cartoon, every app, every video, every, you know what I mean? And so until he got to the age where he was able to to do things on his own in, 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 in high school, quite honestly, because he was 15 years old, like we he knew why we were, why he was engaging with it. And we knew why he was engaging with it, which opened up conversation for us to talk about how it was being used 
and what was working or what wasn't working or what it did. And so it might have appeared that we just gave our kid, you know, uh, uh, let our kid watch the same show over and over again, but his echolalia helped him to eventually form his sentences and be able to communicate. And when he was using those phrases in appropriate ways in conversations, like that was celebrated. Um, so it was just, I'm going back to intention, right? It's it's not random. It's not, hey, just go play with this game. Oh, let me just look over your shoulder and see what you're doing. Like there, there has to be investment and intention on on both parts and what you want to get from it and, and what you're willing to risk as a result. Um, so I don't know if that, well, just, that just popped to my mind when um, Anushka was talking. Yeah. Are there any particular, I guess, um, yeah, I think parents are always looking for the setting or the tool that they, it's a continual process where you always do have to, once you, once they do reach that age of independent use, but like, for example, there is, you know, there is technically a setting on TikTok that is like the four kids, you know, like the, the parent tethered account, or there are Google accounts that are like on YouTube that are the tethered accounts. Um, are those useful in these settings? Is, are those are those useful to up to a certain point um, for kids in this population? Um, your thoughts on some of these, you know, tools that are baked in, um, especially again, like with some of these kids, you know, as they get older, that, that parental oversight might not be appropriate. Mm -hmm. I think some of those tools can really be helpful, but I think, um, you know, to echo what LaShawn said, you know, with my own kids, my my daughter who has a language processing disability, um, uh, I, you know, I've always wrung my hands over the fact that she'd rather watch screens than read from a book. Um, and, but she was turning on closed captioning while she was watching YouTube videos. And she's watching videos about things like four dimensional cubes and space and medicine and genetics. And then she'd come back, you know, she'd be learning to read from reading the closed captioning. And then she'd come back with these great questions about science. And finally, I just said, I, I just get, gave into it, right? If th this is partly what I'm saying about screen time. Like if we're so focused on time and this is the one way that she's learning this stuff. Um, and then I say, oh, look at me. I'm a great parent because I cut her screen time in half. Well, maybe I also cut her learning in half. So like LaShawn said, you got to come back to, what, why is the child using this content? What are they getting out of it? What's happening? How do they feel and act after they get walk away from the screen? Do they seem composed or do they seem more agitated? So if you're seeing signs of agitation or some kind of problem, that's something to investigate. But if the screens are helping them feel composed, then think of them as one tool to help with that kind of regulation and, and learning, but also keep you know encouraging some other tools and other environments so they have a choice. Yeah, Anushka. Yeah, to follow up on that, in my interviews with autistic young adults, and they talked about watching YouTube videos like on repeat or a common a show that they like to watch. And as an anxiety reducer and self-regulating emotions, it's like self-soothing. Uh, and probably you can all relate to that to some extent like after a long day like there's certain shows that I want to watch that just feel good and I and and so I think we can recontextualize like what does screen time mean in those situations that it's they know that this is a tool maybe it's a video game that they like to play with their friends that helps them to self-regulate to then face other parts of the world and the second point I want to make is that they would show me some of them um, like drawings they did of cartoon characters or, you know, anime is super popular in a lot of neurodivergent circles. And then they draw that or they dress up that way. And so I think it, kind of tapping into what is their interest and then encouraging them in real life, like how they're expressing that that joy that they get from that cultural experience they're having through technology. So it's it's a celebrated part and there can be community and identity that they can belong. Like um, people who play Minecraft tell me like they're part 
it's cool to talk about Minecraft with other kids versus if you love Legos and you're now a teenager, you know, they maybe they feel a certain way about going on and on about Legos, but Minecraft is like more socially acceptable. So we also have to realize like it's part of their identity. And in today's world, like tech is so important. So I totally understand wanting to limit and not have it be an addiction. Um, but I think maybe if we can recognize the value that they're getting out of it and then help encourage them to express it in other ways, uh, like through their own creation, that they're not just consuming this media passively, but then how do they add their voice to it um, can be powerful. Great. Um, one last question, like thinking about not just putting I guess, media in the hands of neurodivergent kids, but the tools for them to think critically and consciously about their role in this online world, um, particular resources that youth themselves can use to learn more about digital literacy and safety. Um, I mean, I'm thinking off the bat just of, you know, common sense media as a clearinghouse of, of for, for educators, for parents, but for kids too. There's lots of videos, there's lots of sort of playlists, um, uh, you know, things that you can consume to sort of, because the technology changes all the time, but you have to think about, you know, it's not just the technology, it's also thinking about situations and contexts um, that might like emerge, you know, time and time again. Um, besides any, you know, common sense media or adaptations to that that you can think of for, um, and for different ages, because certainly, you know, it starts young. <laughs> We're all in agreement. There's not great ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's not great ones that I, I know of, but I will say that um, to try, I'd encourage people to try to en engage their child in setting up what the rules are, what the boundaries are. Um, I've seen kids that get together to play video games and they set up like the tournament rules and how long everybody gets to play and, and that there's some like give them the ownership over it um, and it, or Discord has a lot of different settings on it. If you set up a Discord server about different roles that people have and um, that gives them certain permissions to certain channels. So I guess just my small advice is just exposing them to all of these ways that you can control your online media and including them in that. But I wish, I do wish that there were more ways that, they could share this with each other or resources available for them. Yeah, and I'll add to that probably also more in languages besides English um, for parents as well, because there's, um, again, thinking about autistic people come in all shades and colors and languages and backgrounds, and there's not enough, I think, parental support materials and for the kids too, um, that help all parents help their kids equally um, in navigating this online space. I believe we are actually at the end of our time together. So it's time for me, and we're just about over, to reintroduce Chris um, to wrap us up here. Uh, thank you to our fantastic panelists for sharing such a wealth of information and recommendations today. And a special thank you to our audience for tuning in to learn more about this important topic. If you found this webinar helpful and have found value in you, what you may have learned, please consider donating to support future episodes of Ask the Experts and other resources for parents and caregivers. For example, keep an eye out for a special Tips for Parents column based on the insights shared today to be published in the coming months. These research-based resources and so many more are made available entirely free to the public on our website thanks to the support of generous donors just like you. You can explore these resources at childrenscreens.org or follow us on these platforms and subscribe to our newsletter to stay up to date on all new events and resources. If you wish to make a donation, please click through the link in the chat or go to, the, to childrenandscreens.org. Please join us for our next Ask the Experts webinar, Copycat, Social Contagion, Online Viral Behavior, and Youth at noon Eastern on Thursday, February 29th. Until then, thank you and be well.